Listen in. Starbucks. It's a great day for coffee. Salon, and I have a fellow podcaster, radio soul out there with me today that I'm quite excited to get into a conversation with. His name is Chance Garten, and he is an artist of all trades, as I'm reading. We're going to get into that and into his bio, but he has a podcast out there called Innerverse, and that looks to be very exciting, so we will get into that as well. He's had really a long line of very awesome shows that you can see. It looks like he does roundtables and all that, so we're going to get into it. We have never chatted, and so this is going to be a treat. So welcome to the Salon, Mr. Chance. How are you? I'm doing great. Been looking forward to this. Kind of, uh, it's been a while since I've been on somebody else's show. Not for lack of wanting to, just been keeping so busy with my own content. So when I got an email from a mutual listener of ours, shout out to Noel, who said that we ought to get together for a conversation, I was like, great. I love meeting more of my people. And I was I was perusing your most recent releases, and I see that the previous episode that's been posted is. And it, it might not be the previous episode by the time this one comes out, but you talk to Eileen McCusick. She's basically like my my guru. Oh, <laughs> so, pretty sweet to uh, to be following her up in, in a way. That was an awesome chat. Shout out to Noelle Jeanette. She's a good friend and definitely a good friend of the Cosmic Salon. And so big love to her. She's a deep diver. Let's get into this. Let's start traversing this territory. I don't know really anything about your background. Who are you, Chance? (laughs) That's the question that we're all asking ourselves, right? (laughs) As far as I can tell, there's actually no such thing as chance. Chance is just a a word for cause unrecognized. So, (laughs) but in all seriousness, I'm, 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 I feel like I'm a pretty normal dude, but. Then again, when I get into conversations with the ones we might label normie, maybe I'm kind of far out. Uh, I was raised Midwest, waspy, in a, a, de- a really good middle class family and uh, found my way into the emptiness of going through high school and college and afterwards wondering what the heck am I here for. And uh, I, I filled the void with creativity and started just pulling on the thread of, of what was fun to make regardless of how good it was. And eventually that led me into uh, podcasting. I mean, that's a very condensed version of the story, but I started podcasting because I wanted to find, uh, I wanted to create a container for the conversations that I would just naturally have trying to get to the the deep end of the, the big questions of life and how in conversation, I think we both, you and the other person can just really light up with uh, insights and 
figuring out what you actually think and feel about stuff in a way that isn't always ex- accessible in just your own private thoughts. So I enjoy that reflection. I think I'm uh, astrologically attuned for that type of thing as well. Uh, beyond being a podcast host, I'm also a biofield tuner. As I, we just mentioned Eileen McCusick, that's her modality. A couple of years back, I guess maybe three, I don't know, 2019. I, I, wow, it's been a little while. But I <laughs> discovered her work and I was able to heal myself from a long-term injury using one of the tuning forks that she sells. And after that, I thought there's got there's definitely something to this, especially because of the life changes that occurred after I went through the physical healing, making sense of how the external world and the inner world are are not separate, which has always been my philosophy. But <laughs> before biofield tuning, I didn't quite have the the language to communicate with the intelligence of my body and really work the levers of that interface, inner world, outer world. <clears throat> so I started practicing tuning on friends and eventually started taking kind of practice clients. And it really didn't take long before I was able to verify that everything that Eileen talked about in her books was absolutely true. And without taking any training or or courses or getting a certification or whatnot, I've managed to find my way into uh, being quite a proficient tuner, if I do say so myself. Uh, All the sessions with all the the listeners and and referrals that I work with are 100% amazing. (laughs) Super fun. It's like I get to put into practice my favorite thing ever, which is pattern recognition, solving puzzles in a collaborative way. When I'm podcasting, we're doing pattern recognition collaboratively. And when we're biofield tuning, we're doing pattern recognition collaboratively. So that's kind of a little bit about about myself and the, the two things I'm doing most of in my life currently. Excellent. Let's start with the Midwest. Do you mind saying where you're from in the Midwest? Yeah, I'm in southwest Missouri. Are you still Pretty there? Sweet you're, place to be, actually. You're still there? Yeah. Yeah, I live in the same region that I'm native to. Oh, interesting. I'm from the Midwest as well. I'm definitely a Midwestie, but I haven't I haven't lived there in a long time. From Iowa. <laughs> okay. It's not too so, far. It's a little bit north, but my kin are all up in like Minnesota and Wis uh Wisconsin, that kind of that little tri state area. So, it's interesting. Yeah, it's very well, it used to be very waspy. It's different now. It's very, very different in Minnesota for sure. So the biofield tuning, let's get into this a little bit. What led you to it? So you said you were having some sort of ill at ease situation. Do you mind sharing a little bit? You probably have, but I would like to hear this extrapolated a little bit more. Yeah. I mean, it is an amazing story because I had had a left shoulder injury that was persistent I'm not sure. It's not like I was tracking it, but I know it had to have be had to have been at least half a year. Where uh, by the time it by the time I was really trying to do something about it beyond rest and taking it easy, it had gotten to the point where I couldn't even lift my left hand above my shoulder. Like I couldn't raise my hand above my head. So that's pretty severe in terms of functionality problems. And I'm I will I'm still a pretty young guy, and I was definitely young back then. I was like, what, 29 or 30. What I had attributed it to was rock climbing, which I was really into at that age. And I thought if I just take three, four weeks off of climbing, then it's bound to get better. And I would do that and I'd come back to the wall and I would still have this significant issue. And when I heard Eileen talking about biofield tuning on, I think it was Crow 777 and maybe, maybe the higher side chats. I know there's two shows that I heard her on kind of close to each other. And it really rang a bell. <laughs> you know, I've I've actually been interested in energy healing modalities for quite a bit longer than that. I'd say going back to around the age of 23 or 24, uh, where I discovered that I had an aptitude for it in a like a Reiki sense. Not again, not trained, but just I would be able to help friends with headaches or or nausea and things like that with just energy from my hands. So I knew energy healing was definitely a thing. But uh, I picked up her sonic slider, which I do recommend to anybody out there that just wants to have a powerful tool that's very affordable and will last them forever. That can be used for practically anything. 
it's a weighted tuning fork that she might have talked about it while she was on here, but you can apply the uh, the bottom end of it straight to the body after it's vibrating and it transmits that vibration. It's not as audible as your traditional tuning forks, but it transmits that vibration directly into the body. So I got one of those. I started using it on the shoulder and the first day I was using it, the pain got better. And I mean, within a matter of like maybe three three times using it five minutes at a time. Wow. <laughs> I mean, it was noticeable the first time, wow. but that's how much I used it the first day. And then I was like pain free and I kept using it over the next couple of days. And then I had the mobility problem solved. And again, not even using it that much, <laughs> you know, maybe 15 minutes in the whole day total. And it's something that's really easy to do while like maybe you're listening to something or watching something or, or hanging out with somebody you know, I like to have something to do with my hands. <laughs> I'm not very good at sitting still. So that weighted tuning fork was just a really, really useful uh, thing to fidget with, <laughs> generally speaking. Within a week of having it, I'm I'm sure I was able to get back into full-on exercise with no lack of, of mobility or strength anymore. I was like, okay, this is a miracle because I'd had that problem for a very long time. And what I didn't realize, and this is what's the the more mind blowing thing about it, if you know, if you haven't shifted into this mind, body, spirit, inner, outer world, all one thing, everything is everything paradigm that because <laughs> uh, I didn't know about the biofield uh, anatomy, which is something if if you want, we can talk more about. But in the biofield anatomy, it's a theory that says that stuck energy in different areas of your aura that correspond with different parts of your body have actual specific meaning to your emotional or belief states. And I, again, didn't know this at the time, but I'd been in a, a marriage where over, over the years of this marriage, I'd increasingly taken on the role of the, uh, the victimized good guy who's just trying to be there for someone having a hard time, despite how bad they treat me, knowing that if I, or thinking that if I just kept, <laughs> if I just kept going and kept being the nice poor poor me guy that uh, so somehow that would change the the dynamic of our marriage and that this person would or she would get better right um, but I didn't realize I was in that classic empath position where I'm the victimized empath and they're the mean bullying narcissist <laughs> we we get into that position because we feel like as long as we can have a story that puts us as the good person relative to someone else. And there's an excuse for why we're not doing better in our life and we can point at the external person. Uh, it's like it really helps alleviate that fear of success and keep us keep ourselves in a, a comfort zone. And so my comfort zone was that I didn't realize it really that consciously at the time, of course. But after I healed this shoulder injury, which corresponds to that exact thing of of taking on or even being victimized by negative energy from other people or the world that within a matter of like months, I was divorced or on the way to being divorced, oh, definitely wow. separated and the relationship was over, Yeah, which was hard. There's a lot, you know, there's dark night of the soul with all that, but it wasn't as hard as I, I thought it would have been <laughs> after the bandaid was ripped off. I was like, actually, this is so much better. And uh, that's the example of how I came to learn that there was really something to this because I did not go into that healing of my shoulder with the intention of, of freeing myself from a a mutually toxic relationship. I'm not even trying to make her the bad guy or anything. That was just my identity that I was holding on to in that relationship. And going through the physical healing allowed for the the relationship to heal. We're both in better places, I'm sure. And I think um, you know that's that's the magic of of the ma mind body spirit connection. That that's all one thing. Because if we get stuck in one area physically, we can work on it spiritually or emotionally or mentally and get ourselves freed up in the other areas, you know, correspondingly. It's like an old time knowledge that when you shift your frequency, those around you that cannot tune into that frequency tend to fall away one way or another, just naturally, usually, but sometimes it can be more dramatic. And this is kind of a good example of that. Yeah, that's true. People do say that. And for me, it's a, a good experiential demonstration of exactly what you say. And that, you know, a lot of times we hear from talking heads or wannabe life coaches or 
yada, yada, that you got to cut the toxic people out of your life. I'm not saying to not have boundaries, but <laughs> I found that you don't actually have to purposefully shun anybody most of the time. I mean, yeah. You might have to reject something that is not for you in a moment to moment basis, but yeah, you never really have to reject anybody. You, they, you know, things kind of just sort themselves out of their own accord. If you keep yourself coherent, then uh, either the people in your life are going to join that level of coherence or they're going to shift and in a way that they're no longer part of your awareness sphere. But what's cool about that too is I see all the relationships in our life as fulfilling archetypal or symbolic uh, characters or personages that when we let go of uh, a certain version of a, uh, an energy in our life in the form of a, an individual, I find that we always re-encounter that archetype or that persona later down the road in a, a more healed state that is, you know, corresponded to the level of healing that we've achieved or coherence. I just really like the word coherence. Oh, yeah, I agree. I've seen this play out for sure, not only in my life, but in those around me. It, there's a there there, as they say. As far as the bio field, the tuning forks, what is your workhorse? I assume you probably have them all that Eileen offers, and I have heard from everyone, hers are the standard, the gold standard. That is true. <laughs> I, but I will say you don't have to um, – you don't have to spring for the more expensive forks that Eileen offers just to try things out. Although, I mean, I would still recommend just go for the best tool, right? It's not that big of a price difference. Yeah. You might be tempted to, I don't know, one of her forks might cost roughly the same or, or close to the same as like an entire set of, of eight or nine forks from another manufacturer. And that I see... Myself, I had the temptation of like, well, I'd rather just go for the full set because I, I need all of those frequencies. But <laughs> you don't actually, you know, I like it is fun for me to correspond a certain frequency to a certain energy center and allow that tool to hold the the symbolic or intent, like resonance of of a you know as a shortcut. And I, it's not necessary, though. <laughs> if I was to recommend one of her forks off of her site, it would either be the 174 or the 222. I think the 174 is probably the easiest as a learning tool. It's the longest of tines because it's the lowest frequency that she's got on there mm -hmm. or one of. And that longer time thing makes it easier to strike correctly, easier to hear various shifts in the pitch and all that if that's something you're looking for the 222 is going to be close though uh she calls the 222 the peacemaker and i actually only received that one uh i don't know back in march i guess so i haven't had it that long i was using strictly self edgeotones geotones before that but pretty quickly the 222 is becoming my favorite actually but i also have uh, a whole different personally developed methodology of of making decisions and and energetic um, inferences in sessions that's kind of my own thing so what fork i'm using is part of that and uh i don't necessarily play favorites i just let my my intuitive systems and the, the kind of superpower that my body came up with out, out of that decide what i'm going to use but it does seem like the 222 is just really versatile yeah, the 222, we talked about that. I think that's the latest one she created, isn't it? As far as I know. I think yeah, I is. think so too. I think that's what she started with. We opened the show with her doing one of them. I think it was the 222. It's good to hear this, especially since I've recently had her on. But it's good to hear from someone else out on the waves that works with all these and this this uh, modality to kind of solidify how great she is and how great the work this is as far as healing people up, understanding yourself at a deeper level and your biofield. The biofield is such a big deal that people call the aura. It's a body part is what's now become a colloquialism that people don't realize they have. It's also 
being utilized against people and with the emergence of everything that's gone on with the electrical world around us from 5, 6, and 7G, they're already talking 10G with uh, Li-Fi and solid light technology and AR and ultimately VR, the Internet of Things, our biofields are very much something to be cognizant of because there are patents out there. There are people out there in positions that actually affect us on that level. I don't know how woo you get, but uh, well, none of it's woo. It's all, it's all real, but some people don't go there. We go there on my show. It is a big deal. And these modalities that help people are something I'm in love with because there's so much stuff coming on to us, being forced upon us that is putting everyone in a state of trauma, in a state of victimhood, and uh, the weightiness of all that that comes with that alone, not to mention the uncanny valley that we're in and how people are slipping in and out of counter space and this whole thing. So I feel like... This particular route of healing and just, I guess, calibration, personal calibration and helping others calibrate is such a powerful method. And so I was thrilled to see that. I also see that you do Oracle cards. So let's talk about the cards a little bit. You just named a whole bunch of a whole bunch of electronic boogeymen. And they are all definitely part of the the dissonance soup that makes it, you know, that much harder to stay mm, focused in a way. And I wanted to talk about that because what I think is that the biofield anatomy hypothesis is something that's going to hold for hold true for us in this society with all of the 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 digital demons. And for like a a completely off-grid, Luddite, non-technological person, regardless of where we landed in the world, this is actually how your health works. This is how your body works. Your mind isn't in your body. Your body is in your mind. And the beautiful thing about working with the biofield and finding where the flow problems are is that you raise your whole entire like energetic capacitance and that energetic capacitance and the coherence of your personal field, it creates a very powerful boundary at the, at your perimeters that actually gives you a lot of resilience against any of these things, especially on the EMF side. Yes. How I look at the way EMF is affecting us is the best analogy. And it's not even an analogy. It's actually kind of the exact same thing is think about all of the, apparatus in your house that make some sort of annoying sound can you name one i can name many of you know we can start with lights <laughs> yeah or like your refrigerator kicks on and you and it's just a, a strange hum in the background and there's, it's dissonant when i say dissonant versus coherent i'm talking about coherence as a a pattern that has a structure and and consistency to it And that's different from sort of random and chaotic sound like a lot of these electronics put off. So whenever we're in some sort of, you know, immersed in some sort of random chaotic sound, and that actually is what EMF is because sound and light are the same thing on different parts of the perceptual spectrum, that we have to filter out a part of that. We have to filter that sound out. And, you know, so that we can just operate without constantly noticing it and it getting in our in our head or, or bothering us. And just to a large degree, we can filter a lot out without harm. And that's just kind of part of our natural defense mechanisms. But when it's the refrigerator and the air conditioning unit and the Wi-Fi router and the cell tower like across the road and this and that and the cars driving by on the street and the highway – And it's one thing after another, all stacked up on top of each other. The amount of filtration we got to do actually 
can it basically amounts to a a reduction in our baseline level of awareness and consciousness because the every chunk that we're filtering out is a chunk of our consciousness our feeling our awareness so <laughs> we're filtering too many things out at once uh, and we've got a bunch of our personal energy which is the same as our consciousness that is restricted in our biofield based on limiting beliefs about herself or stuck emotional energy <laughs> energy then then that uh that filtration becomes either too much to handle and it starts actually uh, in training and affecting our biology or at the very least it just lowers our level of uh intelligence to put it simply yes. it reduces our aware our uh, our concept of who we are and why we're here and what we actually want, which are such important things. So whenever we can free up all of that stuck biofield energy and and bring our baseline coherence to as close to 100% as possible before all this filtration occurs, then we have the ability to filter a lot of stuff without even noticing that we've we've lost a step. And I think that that's the real power of this is that not only can you heal yourself from anything <laughs> because this is the the root nature and cause of all disease and injury in the first place but you can have a better idea of who you are why you're here increase the level of what i like to call uh the perpetual flow of synchronicity <laughs> and all that and more without even losing a step to the the weaponized technology in the world which i think we're far and beyond capable of handling all of that stuff if we are in our innate wholeness. I go down so many avenues of inquiry regarding all this stuff, what they loosely call Havana syndrome, which is a whole other thing. And I've had Amy Holloman, who I would suggest getting on. She's fantastic. I don't like saying this anymore, but targeted individuals, but it is real because at this point now with the technology, the way it is, the old patentable technology, so 5G, of course, is OG at this point, they do this in mass and they can, of course, triangulate on individuals because of the nature of the biofield and the nature of electronic control it can mimic anything and so i mean i'm sure you know all this so it's easy to create a sickness in the body through external manipulation with these tools that are being used against us that look like a flu a sickness of any kind and this is concerning. And so when we saw all that stuff with the Havana syndrome and the TI stuff come out some time ago now, it's been, it's been quite a long time. It was so woo. People could not understand it. And now at least a good deal of people are understanding because we're deeper into this, that this has been real technology, that the military has used this, but the military has been using this since the 80s. And I really like to get into the Russian documents and look at what they were doing to just protect themselves and their people against uh, us, I guess. And there is so much to unfold there. If you don't speak and read Russian, there's plenty of ways to get things translated. And these documents are significant. And f fortunately, there are people that are putting them out, like um, I call him Big Daddy. Big Daddy at the Museum of Tarot, who's done such an amazing job of releasing. Oh, yeah, I've always wanted to talk to that guy. He seems pretty cool. Yeah, I don't think he does shows. I have two. He, but he's he's really, he's amazing. And I am a big supporter of the stuff he's peddling. 
and um, of his in general. I really enjoy him. But he has really brought forth a lot of Russian stuff. In fact, I'm wearing my halo pulsar right now. I don't ever take it off unless I'm bathing. And that changed my personal frequency. You know, I keep it on the Schumann, but, you know, they you can regrow limbs and stuff through frequency healing. And even with the halo pulsar, the Russians were doing it, and uh, the codes are there. You can do this. And that information isn't as free-flowing here. And now that we're under a big firewall with our search engines, unless you know how to get outside, and some people do, some people don't, it is very difficult to find this information that we once freely were able to get. You would type in a search engine, and you'd have like infinite pages. And now it like bottoms out. That internet. Yeah, now it bottoms out like five. This stuff's real. It's not it's not woo. Although woo ends up being the true. Yeah. I have a really woo perspective on the the frequency war, you know, total. Oh, bring it on, domination. Chance. Bring it on. Well, you know, just to tack on to what you're saying and what and in relation to what I've been saying is I'm aware of documents. I'm aware of individuals who have been targeted by a certain type of frequency weapons. And I'm aware that there's, there is this type of experience to be had, but in my, in my dealings with life and with clients and, and my, I guess my worldview being what it is formed by my own experiences, I actually think that to be vulnerable or susceptible to technology attacks or remote attacks or they doing something to you requires a, a an inner fragmentation for that to even be possible and there is a way to be more or less invulnerable to it <laughs> that sounds crazy but I, I you know it's up to each of us to decide whether or not that's true for themselves and and how they want to respond to life by trying to defend against the external or strengthen the internal. But I like to live from the perspective that the inner world leads the outer world rather than the outer world shaping my inner world. And yeah, from my own, my own experience and my own uh, work with others, what I just said is completely true that there is no vulnerability except from within. But if that inner vulnerability is there, the uh, external things can create all kinds of havoc for you. Well, I very much appreciate that that stance. It's very sunny side of the street, and I, I love that. I kind of stay neutral with all of it, and uh, I, I do believe our perceptions and are a real deal, and I'm a big believer in lucidity and inner world, inner workings, of course, is where it's at. Lucidity is the key, a a rising and awakening within the dream. And I kind of view the experience that we're having, well, I kind of, I do view the experience we're having as a, a greater dream, a collective dream sharing, if you will. And there are tides and masses of people are affected by algorithms, algorithmic flow, I call it Uncle Algo. And there are undeniably, if you just go outside and walk around, everyone's got their phone, you know, I mean, it's, they're all looking at it. You see it everywhere. I mean, it's, it's like an undeniable fact, at least where I live. And I live in a a pretty rebel area where people are kind of anti that. And I still see it everywhere. So this thing with flicker rate and uh, the frequencies coming off of their devices, et cetera, are affecting the collective, collective flow through causality. And causality also is interlaced into the idea of synchronicity for me. And this can be, again, perception is the key. But this can be an interesting inner space between the two modes of functioning. But to me, nothing is as real as being actually lucid within your dream. And lucid requires a state of awareness, both in the 
uh, focus of zero point perception to the periphery. It's in the round. For example, when you're lucid in your dream life, that other state or other dimension that most people experience. Uh, well, for, I can only speak for myself with this, but I've I've been doing this my whole life. It's interesting to be in those spaces and just like walking around this space in the collective dream and seeing everybody preoccupied on their phones and not communicating in their own little bubble. And this, when I'm in the dream space, because it is the inner space that we project outward as well, but that's our own personal thing. We're talking about a collective now. So when I'm in the dream space, I constantly see, and we're talking dream space, so I'm going to say sleepers in context to that. I see most people around me are sleeping and I rarely encounter other lucid dreamers. It's so rare and I'm always so excited about it. I will visit people and then they will have a dream because I'm not encountering them lucid in that space. And so I'll get a dream. You know, someone will say, I saw you in a dream last night and I I take in that information and this is different than actually doing going out of body. This is an internal function for me. This is the way I experience it. When I go OBE and there is no silver cord for me, I've never understood the silver cord. Uh, so I stand against the, a lot of the collective, especially those Monroe Institute folk. That's a whole different experience. And that is... Uh, that's that's an interesting space that is absolutely a lucid space. You're completely strategically aware, I think, is a good way to put it. But the the viscosity of the ether around you is different. And I, when I uh, had a near death experience, it was very similar. Like that they, they kind of were interchangeable. So I, I've always pondered on that idea. Uh, and so I am a believer, Chance, in the inner reflects outer and all that. But do you not notice everyone really being engaged with their phones? Oh, for sure. I notice it. I use the tech myself. Uh, but that that's... Um... You know, that's an external world thing. And anyway, I wanted to back up a little bit and talk about conditioning and how oh, let's do it. I love that. How, just as a, a good example of how conditioning can be seemingly so obvious, but also affecting our how external people are treating us without us realizing it, like that our expectations about life actually have something to do with the way that we're treated by others. And you could call it like a an energetic posture that invites certain type of behavior. Like there's an area of the biofield in the throat chakra on the right side that when there's stuck energy there, it creates a tendency to be interrupted or talked over by others. <laughs> and conversely, you know, you might someone with stuck energy there might find themselves feeling the need to interrupt others a lot too, because that's where their conflict spot is. <laughs> and they're actually I, the joke I make is it's like they're wearing a, you know, like a kick me sign. But instead of kick me, it says interrupt everything I say or don't <laughs> don't pay attention to what I say. <laughs> and the, the person they're interacting with doesn't know that it's all in these subtle cues of body language and vibe. But uh, a client that I worked with recently, we, the first thing she one of the things she wanted to work on was migraines and just sort of muddle headedness, memory problems, things like that. And uh, the first thing I found when I got into the third eye, which is what governs that type of stuff, was uh, she had been given up for adoption when she was just a few weeks old. And in a long story short, apart from that that thing conditioning a lot of her stuck third eye energy, uh, it created a a resonance pattern through her expectation that the people that she was most invested in with care would leave her or ditch her, you know, ditch the relationship with her. And then she was going through cyclical repeating patterns of that. 
Uh, how I realized it was a pattern was as I kept going through the third eye, I found that I think she was like 11 years old that a friend had abandoned her, like moved to a, a neighboring town and then was too cool for her because she made cooler, preppier friends. So anyway, we worked with that pattern to just demonstrate to her like, okay, this experience at birth of being given up for adoption um, and the fact that <laughs> uh, basically, you know, there was a component to it without getting too detailed that said the energy I invest into these relationships that I'm abandoned with, I lose that investment. So every time this pattern had recurred, it had lowered her energetic threshold by an amount and it had kept recurring in her life. And she didn't even quite understand that it was a recurring pattern and certainly didn't understand that it was based on an expectation. But I know, I know that there was a, energy being released at that third eye zone because as soon as I was putting the fork in it, the beginning of the session, without even saying a word about what I was inferring in that zone, she was already weeping tears. So that's the uh, mm. the the release energetically that was needing to occur. Yes. So this is the kind of thing, um, you know, there's another recent example, uh, and you wanted to talk about Oracle cards. So that's why I'm bringing up this example because this is kind of fun. I was... <laughs> I, uh, I was working with somebody who had some type of digestive issues that were manifesting as a skin condition, the, the medical mainstream calling it autoimmune. I don't believe in that thing, that sort of thing, but that's what it was labeled as. And I found, uh, I think it was around the age of like eight years old, maybe. Can't recall. I have notes on all my sessions, of course, but in case I work with somebody again, but uh, I will sometimes use the tarot or other types of Oracle cards in session. I don't really bother wasting time talking to the client about what I drew from the tarot. I just skip to the inference and work with them on that level. But I drew uh, the chariot card. And as soon as I saw it, I knew I was like, oh, his mom took his bike away. <laughs> so I, I draw the card and it gives me an instant like connection to a, a deeper level of insight. So there's the biofield anatomy hypothesis that says stuck energy at certain areas of the field has a certain general meaning, but then each of us will take on a, a conditioning that's unique for that individual that is like, how does, what type of experience is it that gets you stuck in anxiety or what type of experience is it that you're triggered to, to frustration by? Because we all have different things that will you know, roll right off of our back or cause us to spiral. <laughs> so anyway, I found that like, okay, his mom took his bike away. It was uh, related to this larger thing of feeling like he needed to, he was stuck to, powerless uh, to get things in the timing that he wanted them and that he would have to wait. And that by the time it, what he wanted was available, it would be too late. And so that was like a whole deal that he was um, unaware of until I presented it to him. And he's like, yeah, of course, of, of course that, that, that is how it is for me. And the funny thing about it in terms of how s patterns repeat thematically that they might not be so obvious that it's the same thing coming back around again is, you know, as an adult, you might think I got my bike taken away and I never got it back. And it was a really cool bike. No big deal though. I'm growing up now. I don't care about that. But when you're younger, the younger we are, the more intense experiences are. I mean, another thing I found about, uh, you know, with this particular client was a time where he wasn't allowed to have the foods that he most wanted. And I, I was like a three-year-old and I brought it up and he's like, yeah, I, I'm told that I used to always kind of flip out about wanting the, uh, the cereals at the grocery store in the cereal aisle. And my mom wouldn't let me have it. So again, a kind of similar dynamic of being forced to wait for things. And in both cases, it's his mom that is the sort of you know, the representative of the restriction or the powerlessness, which our mothers actually, generally speaking, are responsible for forming our our polarity of power to powerlessness in our yes. biofield, which yeah. is interesting. And it's not that his mom's the bad guy. We don't do bad guys in biofield tuning. We just observe what is and what the conditioning says. But in terms of, of parents, especially the parents of the opposite gender, they represent the closest individual of the, uh, you know, the yin to your yang or the yang to your yin. 
in the case of a male, the divine feminine. And as an adult, that role gets supplanted by the girlfriend or the spouse, right? And so what had happened, the next thing that I found that was only within like the last year was that uh, a similar situation where he had uh, he had agreed with his girlfriend that they were going to reduce down to one car. But then when it came down to it and they only had one car and she wanted to use it for something, he freaked out about or, you know, had an overreaction, I guess I should say, that caused a big fight over being concerned that he wouldn't be able to have the car if he needed it in the timing that he needed it. And he never had understood why he had had this overreaction that had caused such a big, you know, dispute in their relationship and a bad experience until we went through and combed his biofield and found the, uh, the early life patterns. And the great thing about that is once you get aware of a pattern, a conditioning, a trigger like that, then you always have this la level or layer of uh, filtration so that when you experience that pattern or filter again, you you are behind the trigger or behind the conditioning. You know, once you know, you can't not know. <laughs> and then at that point, you get to bring free will to the equation instead of just reacting. If you do that even just once or twice when the pattern recurs, the expectation and the conditioning and the adaptation and all that is dropped and it doesn't keep coming back around again in different forms. And then you've really made some sort of major shift in yourself and in the way that you're going to experience life. Because like with this, with these examples, it's stuff happening, perceivably happening to us in these examples, but what's happening to us that is an external thing that seems out of our control. Like, you know, as Jung would describe it, the, uh, the uncontrollable forces of the unconscious projected into the, the, uh, the collective. But those things, those uncontrollable forces of our unconscious are still programmed by our unconscious and our unconscious is made up of beliefs and expectations. So if we can actually get in there, you know, the metaphor I use for that is say you got a, you have a digital camera and when you received it, you didn't know how to use it and you started messing around with the menus and picking random settings. And then you've had it for a few years uh, and you got better at using it and understanding how it worked but you never reviewed the settings. And so in biofield tuning, we're literally fine tuning someone's psyche and we're going in and finding those settings that they forgot that they had chosen and re reverting them to, some, to something optimal that's actually in alignment with, with their spiritual purpose for being and their higher self. And mm. all of that actually improves the physical health and restores function to areas of the body that are, are having problems. And it's uh <laughs> it's really quite amazing. So those are just a couple of, you know, it's always the most recent sessions that I talk about because I can't, there's so many, I can't necessarily remember them all that easily, but those are some that come to mind that show that cyclical repetition of patterns that are rooted in a an expectation conditioning. This idea of accessing these core complexes, I find deeply fascinating things like Sufi dancing and temple dancing and these kinds of things that really get your biofield moving, get you in tune with it. The pilo erection that happens on your, on your skin with the hair and the power of all that is something I've always been, I think awe inspired by because I can feel that I can get into that mode. I actually have, Crystal pyramids, they're, they're real crystal and they're pyramids and you strike them and they're all tuned properly. And I enjoyed those before I found Eileen stuff. I had seen tuning forks, but I was, I don't know, it was one of those things. And the, the crystal pyramids have been amazing for me in my life. And they have helped with not only changing an actual mood and I don't know anything other than the way things make me feel. So the whole Eileen protocol with the biofield map and all this other stuff, this is all new to me and it's something I'm going to bring into the mix of my life, but I don't have experience 
within you this. And the more I hear, the more excited I am. But the only thing I can relate it to is something like the crystal tuners that I have and gong sessions and uh, sound stuff and then um, going into isolation chambers and getting into that space, which reminds me of really being in the, the ultimate, the other dream space other than this. And so I do share this with you. I think that the work is internal and that through the internal work, we shift and Jung always said changing consciousness at will is the, the goal. Individuation is the goal. Changing consciousness at will, which puts a person in a state of neutrality. And if we are able to choose where our energies flow and how they flow, meet people where they are, etc., then we're actually the awakened dreamer within the dream because we are not being controlled by these forces, either inside or outside. And then I experienced this personally with Shaolin temple training, martial arts, right, out of China. And so this stuff, you start dot connecting it, and you realize that all of these things are so interwoven in the wholeness and health of being and of being a being in the process of whatever we want to call this. Because there's something interesting about our outer world experience that is very compelling. The collective out here where you and I are communicating is where most people think the show is. And I don't think the show's here. I believe the show is elsewhere. But I believe in non-locality. And so this is an interesting idea when thinking about how we form and fill reality. How we look at the angles in which we choose to walk the world to kind of get into that castanada, the good stuff, not the cultish stuff. I like what you're saying. I actually have a theory that I like to think that what we're doing right now, communicating from across, you know, state to state or even across the world is something that is just an intrinsic capacity of what we are in essence. But because of the the collective game we're playing or dream we're running and the the rules about the game, <laughs> we have to create the narrative of this technological method that allows it to be possible but i think this just mind to mind communication right now <laughs> and then i yeah the the young thing is is interesting to me because a lot of a lot of the interpretation of young tends to look at the uncontrollable forces of the unconscious as some kind of persistent unvanquishable enemy when in fact every time that it comes into your path and trips you it's actually trying to show you where it is that you're incomplete or where it is that you've not brought consciousness to the unconscious or made a conscious choice with free will rather than playing out conditioning. And another thing that I, you know, if I could talk to young uh, man to man, I would love to have a conversation with them about synchronicity because as I push forward in my own path of learning, I'm, finding that synchronicity is actually not the exception. It's the rule. Yeah, every single yep. thing that's happening in every moment consists of incredible synchronicity beyond all, you know, there is no, I started this conversation saying chance is just a cause unrecognized, but I think that what prevents us, you know, whether or not we're aware of synchronicity and looking out for it or the type of person that, doesn't even register the concept. I think everything is synchronicity, but our symbolic literacy can be lacking. And if our symbolic literacy doesn't, isn't up to speed in the complexities of ways that the, of, that life can express meaning to us and connect that meaning uh, across all 
phenomenon at all times to show that everything truly is everything, then we'll miss the synchronicity and we'll miss the excitement or the enthusiasm about life that is the true zero point free energy, you know, super, super gnosis <laughs> that 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 boosts our biofields beyond anything else. Because it's always the lack. It's lack and limitation that does the most and and repression that does the most harm to our our physiology as it as they those things function in our biofield. And in that sense, our symptoms in our physical body, when we view them as symbols, that also is what unlocks our ability to see the larger pattern and to break the pattern with free will. And so that's why uh, I find it not super surprising that I wound up having a really great aptitude for biofield tuning. You know, there are certain things about my personal, like astrological configuration or whatever that I think gave me a particular leg up. I found out recently human design explains my, my uh, individual superpower with biofield tuning, which we could talk about, but you know, my other, the other side of my, my interests you know, that governs the majority of my interest outside of out of holistic healing is symbolism, language, mythology, yes. the mystery traditions of the ancient world and the monomyth and how the monomyth or as we understand it in astrotheology, our story in the stars uh, expresses in everything at all times. And that, I, you know, I've gone so deep into the categorization of the various keys of the system of universal priesthood from the ancient world that I could watch any Hollywood movie or TV show. And, and it, you know, as far as I can tell, they were just straight up ripping off the old esoteric doctrine. Yeah. But oh yeah. that might not even be the case in all, in all, in, in every instance, you know, I think it might actually be that there is just this, one story or monomyth because there's a particular order of operations in which nature or the creative force builds and organizes living systems. And I think every system is living. I think that you can apply the the precepts of human psychology to artificial entities. You can look at a, a corporation and based on if it's 70 years old or, or five years old, have an idea of how it might behave. You know, the 15 year old is going to act more rebellious, do the opposite of what you think it's going to do. <laughs> I'd like to thank uh, Waters Above, uh, Jordan over at Waters Above for that particular uh, tidbit, because that totally is how I see things. But I'd never like heard it articulated quite like that before. But my point being, studying the studying the symbolic canon of the ancients and learning the language not only is that symbolic literacy constituting the first line of psychic self-defense, but it even can be taken on the offense yes. to, to predict or at least be, you know, less rattled by the ways that the, um, <laughs> the conspiratorial forces, I guess, those uncontrollable aspects of the unconscious as expressed in the, the, uh, the narratives of our collective humanity, how those things play out. Uh, to separate yourself from that, what you see in it that doesn't resonate as true and accept that it's um, that there's always going to be those sort of wild <laughs> and chaotic forces knocking at the door of everything that we hold dear, that we consider orderly, that they're all there to strengthen us just like that unconscious uh, expression in our personal lives that trips us up, but actually winds up making us more wise or stronger in the long run. And in that sense, I see that just all, all things that we categorize as evil serve good. It doesn't mean I'm saying there's no such thing as evil or no such thing as bad. There is subjectively, and there is definitely such a thing as willfully ignoring what is evil or harmful to yourself or others. And like, that's definitely what we would call bad. And you know, it, it will bear the, the, the rotten fruits of, of that particular uh, malintent, right? But still, I've just, I've just yet to ever encounter something in my life or witness something in somebody else's life that that was bad or or evil or a challenge or a struggle that didn't, in the long run, a long enough timeline, wind up being for the better. 
It's always that way. So that's why I'm on the sunny side of the street because <laughs> I, I've just yet to be able to prove that inference wrong. Um, but I think it it also, you know, it is the way that things will be filtered through the lens that we look at them through. And so on the the dark side of the street, if you will. <laughs> the shadowy may, side. May, the shadow side. They might feel the exact opposite of what I'm saying, but uh, that's that's uh, that's their choice. But I really like the... The, the research into symbolism and particularly syncretism to show that all of the systems of religion and mythology are derived from the same source, which is nature. And that all of the miracle stories are based in the language or scripture written in the stars based on the names of constellations and stars and their relationship to each other. Mm. And uh, yeah, that's, that's my other entire sphere of interest that is huge. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's where I started out here in the public arena uh, in this iteration of my life. Symbols are everything. And, you know, I go on and I'm constantly talking about how the difference between the collective symbols and then our personal symbols, which is our own key, because we individually develop symbols that I think people oftentimes want to attribute a generality to some symbols. So, and you know, obviously you've read Jung, that if you've grown up in a forested area, that's the symbol for the collective. If you've grown up around the ocean, that tends to be the symbol for the collective. So it's all in context to your point on the map, if you will the map of angles and then from there when you start getting personal an idea a symbol of an apple or a glyph may be completely different between two people because of associations in context to your place and this is where it gets very tricky so like the people that resort to like the buy, I have a bunch of these books. I I I didn't have to buck against Christianity because I wasn't raised in it. I bucked against the New Age. That's where I rebelled, and so I had like by the time I was eleven, I probably had every book written on symbols at that time. So I would be like, okay, I dreamt of an owl. What's this book say? What's that? And cross pollinating, and I have found when I listen to people translate symbols without knowing a person, that that's damaging. I think it's easier when I was running my show, Nox Mente, which is, was about dreams and consciousness and ta- it's a, a show on symbols. And, you know, it was always like getting a little background. Where are you from? You know, what were the things that you were into as a child, etc.? And getting a feel for a person so that you can start to unfurrow their specific symbols and then move forward as somebody reading the symbols. But I do believe that's the real language of the universe and it's dynamic. It is incredible. And I think that for people that go down that pathway, it is so rewarding to understand how Everything around us is absolutely living symbols. That's what it is. It's all glyphs, and they all have a life, and we feed it. And, you know, it can be a a nasty agrigore or uh, tulpa, whatever. But I wanted to get, as we were talking here, I have a couple questions about what are your thoughts on the nature of time? What What do you think all that is, all this is? (laughs) <laughs> Can I start with I I don't know. <laughs> and that's a great place to start because then we get the the territory is open and we can we can chew the cud here. Well, I do find it fascinating that back to the the monomyth all of the all of the systems have time as the the chief deity in a sense. Yes. And there's the and the biofield is an interesting thing that kind of demonstrates reverse causality. And that really throws a, a monkey wrench in the linear concept of time. And I'll explain what I mean by that. But, you know, to, to preface, there have been a lot of studies about uh, 
our our interaction with time that we're able to physically or materially demonstrate that there is something else going on rather than just a straight line. There's the research. I'm, I think Dean Radin has done a lot of this research, but I'm sure many other researchers, he's just a good like spokesperson for it and representative of it, but where they'll sit somebody down in front of a, a screen and they have electrodes hooked up to their body that measure skin conductivity and our skin conductivity will shift, you know, essentially dilate or uh, open or close in a way based on uh, responses to things that emotional reactions to things we're seeing. And so the, the this type of research would show how in the basically a computer would randomly select the a uh, an image to show or a little clip to show uh, the person and they didn't know what they're going to see it would either be like it could be violent it could be somebody in a extreme grief or suffering or it could be peaceful like a meadow it could be pornographic or erotic the whole gamut of possible things that there's you know physiological biomarkers that are uh, consistent in a human being's response to those types of emotional inputs and what they would find is that the the person would actually begin priming in the direction of the reaction that they're going to have not only before the image was actually flashed up before them but before the computer had even made the selection in its random number generator system of what was going to be shown so <laughs> <laughs> so and that's like uh that's a very consistent thing that was repeated in, in many exper like experimental studies. That is interesting because it seems to show that our bodies know what's going to happen before what's going to be ha what's going to happen was even decided by whatever factor it was that's doing the deciding. So that throws a huge wrench in the whole time concept. <laughs> it's, it's incredible, and I actually got that pilo erection <laughs> as you were talking about the goosebumps. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's it's incredible to even to even ponder how how much depth there is here when we start getting into this kind of juiciness. Yeah, the time question is really juicy. <laughs> I also, I'm aware of, uh, I'm not as aware of like the sourcing on, on these studies, but I have heard about uh, experiments where they'd have people take uh, tests and one group would be given the material to study before the test for a, a, like a lengthy amount of time to prepare. Another group would be just kind of exposed to it in a, like, here's what it's going to be about. Look at it all real quick. You get just a flash of it. And then now you're taking the test. And then the, and, and basically the, the group that was not exposed to it for a prolonged amount of time, they would also be given the materials to study for a prolonged amount of time after they had taken the test. So they've already taken the test and the group that was studying after the test did better than groups that were not study that uh, <laughs> did better than groups that were not studying after the test. And then there's the control group of studying before the test and all that. And I'm not exactly sure how it was structured, but essentially what they found was that if you had people exposed to the material for a prolonged study, they would have in the future, they would do better on it in the past <laughs> it's so weird it is but doesn't that kind of speak about like aptitude yes how sometimes people just pick something up and they're like oh this is my jam and i'm just like a savant at it and then they get really into it and become well studied in it yeah but they were immediately had an aptitude for it on that what do you think about this idea because there are these people out there in the world they say that people that get in the presence of books some people could sleep with them. I think this was a story that went around with Casey where yeah, he, Edgar Casey. Yeah. And, and you can just absorb that the energy, the energetics of the book and know the book, the contents. And this is, this ties into all this. And yeah, that's all, that's all anecdotal for me. I'm not saying it's not possible for some people. Um, it's a, it's an interesting component for sure. But in terms of like another example of re seeming like re retroactive editing of the past, the fact that I can work with somebody's 
Biofield and help them reframe their perspective about a story that they have in their past, you know, essentially helping them choose a new meaning. So that's one of the beautiful things about about meaning is that because it's so multivalent, we can <laughs> we're doing even though you might think, no, things mean what they mean. Actually, you're deciding what they mean or or assuming what they mean all the time from a huge range of possibilities. Every word has multiple definitions or means something else in other languages, potentially. And we're just constantly filtering them through our expectation projections about what we think that they should mean or that assuming that they mean intent, right? And so intent and meaning are are these things that we have the capacity to modulate through our free will. And there's been tons of times where somebody's got a story about something happening to them in the past. I use this example because it's fairly recent. I think it's really profound of somebody who was uh, born from a a mom who had had several miscarriages before she finally gave birth to her daughter, who was the client. <clears throat> and the daughter or the client, she had, was studied in traditional Chinese medicine and was an acupuncturist. Really great lady. I loved working with her. But she was going through kind of a funk. And one of the things that we uncovered in the her biofield was the story about her birth and how the inference that she had come to decide to land on or assume as the truth or the meaning of how, of how she came to, you know, came to life in the world was based on the Chinese medicine uh, authority saying every time a mother has a miscarriage, they lose Jing energy, which is a certain type of vital force. Yeah. And so a baby born from a multi multi miscarriage mother or a mother who's already had several, several children is more likely sickly, you know, prone to illness, weak, et cetera. And so she was carrying around that story about herself and she was having a lot of like recurring illness, low energy, depressed states and all that. And we got behind that story and I offered to her, I was like, but what if the fact that you were born when the previous pregnancies were miscarried, what if that meant that you were the one that was the strong one yeah. rather than the weak one? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and I just totally flipped her couch around, you know, like it was, uh, it was amazing. One of the things I love about sessions is we'll be on video call on a zoom call before we actually get into the tuning. And then during the tuning, I turn video off cause that the visual layer of input just is, is a distraction for me. But after we're done with the session, then we'll turn video back on. And sometimes I don't even recognize the person as the same face from before. <laughs> Like the light in their eyes can really dr drastically shift or their whole countenance can really drastically shift. Uh, and that was an example of somebody who was like in a very low, having a hard time state, understandable, kind of overworked, undervaluing herself uh, in how, like, cause what she was doing for others was very valuable. But because of the undervaluing of what she was doing, it was like causing her to get overloaded with work, too much work. And so a lot of that session was like, hey, ask for more. <laughs> if you ask for more, then you can give more. That's just – and you are and you have you are valuable enough to ask for more. And anyway, that's a perfect example though because – or examples uh, where sometimes there's an immediate physiological shift are particularly interesting because a long – like a, another example would be somebody with a long-term habit of having a guilt – persona of of their productivity that says i've got a <laughs> I basically it's sort of like a, a boomer generation tendency especially of the no pain no gain mentality yeah oh yeah That says like <laughs> if i'm not suffering then i am guilty of not trying hard enough <laughs> and this is like a very western mentality like if it's supposed to hurt if i'm if it's not hurting i'm not doing enough uh, but actually, that that just blows out people's hips over the course of a lifetime, <laughs> habitually thinking and behaving that way. That's the that's the right hip killer. You wonder why there's so many yes. hip replacements yes. in in the West. It's largely related to that. And also, when your hips get out of alignment, your legs get different length. And I've worked with people with leg length discrepancy, and then we rectified the mental 
configurations that were holding their hips out of sync. And within, within a day, two, three days tops, their legs are the same length again. So how, you know, we're, you would presumably that misalignment is something that was developed over a, uh, a long-term habitual pattern of behavior, according to like the materialist worldview. And even the the more honest and helpful of the medical professionals, the chiropractors, they would tell you, well, if we're going to fix this, it's going to take many months of adjustments and you're going to have to do all these stretching exercises and, you know, we'll get you there, but it's going to take, it's going to take an equivalent amount of time to realign as it took to get out of alignment, maybe not, you know, one to one, but essentially you get what I mean. But when we shift the perspective on what their life means and the story of their past and their, 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 the the tuning of their psyche or their settings, the, the physical change that took years to get out of whack gradually can shift back into whack instantly as if, as if the past never happened that way. So there is some kind of weird reverse, like retro editing of, of what we consider the past, but it's not that weird whenever you know that the past doesn't actually exist. Neither does the future. Right. There's only ever right now. Yeah. The past is a story and the future is an expectation. And both of those are malleable with free will. And that puts so much power back in your driver's seat to know that. You brought up something that made me think about some of the teachings from very strict and I guess I don't know orderly martial arts and I'm not talking about like the taekwondo stuff I'm talking about where there's like the sifu from say the Shaolin temple or the Kung Fu that is way more structured and uh, I don't know how to put this there's a big huge focus on internal martial arts and why one fights etc it's a whole it's a whole system i think they all are whole systems but in particular the shaolin is very focused on on the internal martial arts and there is some precedence within this ancient system of hardship of creating a stronger will of creating a more lucid state of being through some amounts of hardships. Like a Sifu, like one of my Sifus was just ruthless. I always felt like he was picking on me. And this was my perception, of course. And I was very young at the time as well. And this was my perception that it was like, why is he singling me out? And I was, I'm very strong. And I never understood it because I was like, arguably one of the strongest people in there as far as directing the energy. And that's what I mean is not necessarily physically strong. And I couldn't understand. I always had this feeling again, this is where I was coming at from my experience of understanding what Sifu was doing, but it was like, you seem like kill bill, you know, you go up and down those stairs a million times and you're like, what am I doing? What is, what does this have to do with anything? There can be a sense of cruelty, but for me, and this is what I'm saying, ultimately I moved past this and got to a deeper sense of self through that. And I'm not a boomer. There was something there, but I've long been a a proponent of you don't have to, I'm an artist for, I I mean, I, we're all a bunch of things, but art creativity is, you know, I think most of us that are living, uh, life in a certain way understand that creativity is actually the core here and so my bigger idea is that through the things I found challenge in through the things that seem to bring hardships through deaths or all kinds of stuff that can happen and the stuff we get feeling intense emotions towards for me personally have created some of my favorite pieces of art depending on what I was doing at the time and that the expression of working that out now remember the core here is the Jungian idea of getting it out 
and expressing it in some sort of an uh, art form. Of course, it was the man- mandalas and, and stuff like that are very familiar in and amongst the Jungian crowd, but there's so many other ways: singing, cooking, you know, gardening, painting, needle arts, etc. That moving that energy out of the body and into something, forming and filling, which is more of a martial arts and internal structural martial martial arts kind of uh, way of looking at it, is so rewarding. And I don't want to say or suggest that that wouldn't come or that the, these things wouldn't come in another form when you're compounded. It's like a friend of mine, her son was just killed by a drunk driver, but just prior, not that long, her mother and her sister are both dead. So she's got all this compounded death energy and, you know, what do you do with that? And, and of course, we're all in engaging in what's going on but this was a lot of death all kind of in the same you know this is a lot of death and out of sequence too you know it's always harder when you see like the parents having to bury their children and especially if the there's like a murder scenario or if it's you know it's uglier and it's not i don't want to categorize because everyone's going through the process but this out of sequence thing can be very traumatizing on the body and we don't know it. And so that energy can be transmuted and it can be in its own time, as we're talking about here, turned into something where the soul comes out triumphant, where one comes out triumphant. I have always believed that choosing victimhood, I'm saying that is choosing victimhood through all my personal hardships. I know I'm going to come out somehow changed. I know I'm going to come out more forged. And so those hardships have created a more beautiful me. And through creating a more beautiful me, I have created some really wonderful pieces of art across the spectrum that I'm very, dare I say, this is hubristic, but I'm very proud of. Because I look at, say, a painting, and I know the story, and I never tell the stories. I Once you let go of art, I believe it's the next person who's viewing it or experiencing it. It's their relationship, not yours. That's why I never really put anything in the artist statements about pieces. And so I think there is a value in trauma, but I don't think that that's necessarily the way towards gnosis. I think there are other ways, as you're saying, But I just wanted to counterpoint you there as far as I think there's a value for it. And if we can find a pathway by choice, by... Yeah, there's value. I mean, it's unavoidable. Yeah. It's it's always going to be part of the experience in a cyclical way because we are in... We are infinite (laughs) and we're in an infinite... I agree with uh, that. You know, we're in an infinite potential... Uh, reality, which means no matter what, there's always the, the the chance for the unexpected to come around and subvert your what you thought were your intentions. But I, I actually still hold the, uh, you know, this is a philosophical ground, right? All philosophy requires some sort of a ground that is a, a inevitably a belief. Yes. So I'll admit to that, but I do believe that <laughs> our, our uh, even the things that we don't think we wanted we actually you know there was a free will component some on some level that was before or beyond our our you know little little s self ego here and to me that's a that's a choice that's a a meaning choice kind of like i talked about you know you get to decide the meaning of certain things for yourself that that makes me feel more uh able to cope whenever something doesn't go my way. Like whenever a restriction appears in the external world that I wasn't expecting and now I can't do whatever it was that was my intention. I really try to take a step back at that moment and say, what can I do with this? What does it mean that I can't go over here? What does it mean that I'm being forced to go over here? Is there an opportunity in the over here? that I was overlooking because I was so focused on over there. And inevitably I see one almost instantly 
when I hold this mindset. And so then I accept it and I say, oh, thank you. I know my path now. <laughs> and uh, that doesn't mean that I'm immune to suffering. Trust me. You know, sometimes things don't go our way. Uh, in, and it's hard to see the I know my path or even whenever you do uh, still ha- like it still hurt. <laughs> it is what it is like we're we're human beings and and that's OK. Uh, but I do like, you know, to go come back around on the time concept. I thought it would be fun to maybe riff a little more on that from the like the, the mythology symbolism level. See what we can learn about it. So does that sound good? Oh, yeah, I'm totally game. This is what we're doing here. We're having a conversation. <laughs> <laughs> yes, for sure. So first thing is when you go back into, say, like the Old Testament, you'll find that the English translation that we're given from the original Hebrew is woefully inaccurate to the uh, the actual meaning of the Hebrew words. For example, just starting at the beginning, the Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created, actually says the first word is barashit, which means by wisdom. (laughs) It actually means by wisdom. Mm. And then it says Elohim. And actually, that's even potentially inaccurate. I've found reason to dispute that, that it should be pronounced Alayim, Mm. which means goddesses plural yes <laughs> so <laughs> not just uh, multiple gods but it actually means multiple goddesses yes. interesting so it's not in the beginning god created it's by wisdom the goddesses created yada yada so i'm so that feeling right away, this chance i'm so feeling this <laughs> <laughs> well so right away that totally shifts what the the modern mainstream Christian doctrine or even, you know, whether it's Protestant or Catholic, yada, yada, totally shifts that doctrine because it is accepted belief in the dogma that there was nothing. And then God said, let there be light. And then there was a something and not nothing. But the original traditions that Christianity was basically like, a, you know, congregated out of, they held that there was a primordial matter that was always in existence. It never didn't exist. And that God simply shaped that matter into an orderly form yes. that gave us the semblance of a, a world that we have. You know, the primordial chaos is something you could call it, right? And even in the uh, like the flood mythos, that's based on a much larger and older cycle that, that held that on a cyclical pattern, the order of the world would be destroyed, but the matter of the world would never be destroyed. And (laughs) when we think about the names of, (laughs) of uh, father and mother or like God and goddess, the Latin word for mother is mater, which is the same as matter. And the father in Latin is pater, which is the same as pattern. So the yang (laughs) energy of the masculine focused, single pointed consciousness awareness or intent that is what brings a pattern or order to the peripheral circular total whole chaotic field of the all that is that we call matter or the chaos and that's the interaction of the you know the divine masculine and feminine but then going even further into this <laughs> what's interesting is the uh the whole idea of a god and goddess is is more of just like a, a philosophical conceptualization of those yin and yang forces where the deeper level of the the mythos would actually hold that there wasn't a separation between the two. Uh, that the the deity was androgynous and the entire body of the deity was the entire world. So you could look at it like the entire cosmos was this mater – or goddess, but it, the mind was the pater or the, the pattern or the father. So in that sense, the God formed, you know, reformed its own body and the components of it through its intent, through its will or its mind and, and brought a pattern to it. Now that is super powerful because it implies uh, an, uh, an understanding 
of exactly what I've been talking about in this whole conversation, that the power of your mind can actually change the pattern of your physical matter of your body. And that they're just describing this on the macrocosm level, the entire cosmos, whereas we're experiencing it in a microcosm, but it's all a whole system of like nested Russian dolls. Now, in, in the Old Testament Hebrew, they say Adam means earth, right, or dirt, but I, because <laughs> he's made from the dirt, but I actually disagree with that. I think that it meant the entire earth, like the whole world. And there's reason to believe that in cross-examining the name Adam with other languages. For example, Ethiopian, which may be an obscure language today, but in terms of the, the mystery schools of the ancient world was a very relevant, very relevant language. And in that language, Adama means beautiful, elegant, pleasant, or in other words, beauty that is derived from order. F interesting, because the word cosmos of the gr ancient Greek means that exact thing, beauty derived from order. Mundus in Latin it mean, is the word for world, and it means elegant, adorned, clean, neat, tidy. Mundi is world. Mundus is elegant, adorned, etc. But you see what I mean here. <laughs> now, there's also even little tricks that you can do with philology. This is sort of a side tangent, but philology uh, is the study of the change of of languages from of words from language to language as they're shared, borrowed, or or transmitted across time or across cultures. And one of the the tricks of philology is being aware of what letters swap into other letters, whether through dialects or accents or changes of, of alphabets or the powers of notation from one alphabet to another. So long story short, the letters M and W are occasionally interchangeable between dialects or languages, as are, are the letters N and R. And so you change those <laughs> uh, N and R and L. Those are all kind of swappable. It's called a roticism in linguistics. So if you if you do those swaps, I know it's kind of a lot of swaps, but it's interesting that mund, as in mundi or mundus, becomes world. You know, if you add R and L, or if you just swap the R, the N to an R, it becomes the word. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Or if you do the uh, the D or the T swap, then you get mount out of mund, which is the sacred world mountain, which is a a you know, a microcosm, macrocosm conception that's part of the mystery tradition. But backing up to the whole world meaning the same thing as beauty derived from order and that Adam in Ethiopian means that exact thing, that's very interesting <laughs> because in the Sanskrit books, the first two persons, the primordial persons are Adin yes. and Eva. Yes. Now, you look at vowels in philology as always interchangeable. Just as somebody in the northern United States will say a vowel sound completely different in their accent to somebody in the south, right? So, Adin is Eden. Adin and Eva, the two first persons in the Sanskrit cosmology. That's so Adam is Eden. <laughs> Adam is the primordial world. It gets even more interesting because the Greeks had no words terminating with the letter M. So their version of Adam was Adon, Adonai. <laughs> you go back to the, uh, the, say, the Phoenicians, they called Saturn or the, the god of time. They called him Adonis. He was the son of heaven and earth. Or looking at the Old Testament Hebrew, they don't use the word God and Lord. They use words like, you know, one of the most common words to refer to the deity is Adonai. Yes. The Phoenician sun god, son of the heaven and earth, god of time, but also the whole world. <laughs> it gets pretty meta because you put Adam backwards and it becomes the word meta in, <laughs> <laughs> in philology. <laughs> uh, but, it, you know, it goes, it kind of goes on and on. But it's very interesting how these concepts of space and time become um you know, we, we see that as like some sort of modern Einsteinian discovery, like, oh, space time. But this is a very – everything in, the, in modern science, scientism is a materialist edit or, or plagiarism of the ancient mystery school doctrine. 
And uh, just a last tidbit about that that will let you know that what I'm saying has <laughs> has some truth to it or evidence towards it is that in Greek, in ancient Greek, the word space is horos, which is exactly the same as horus, where whence we get the word hours, presumably, uh, from the Egyptians. <laughs> but ho, ho, uh, horos is space. And chronos is time yes. in Greek. It's almost the same exact word. So uh, there's something about that as well that, you know, it could go kind of on and on and talk about the the death and rebirth of the sun as the template for all of this. But I'll just kick it back over to you. This is the the kind of this is the kind of stuff that really gets me going is is looking at this syncret- syncretic mythology and language. I love it. I love it. There's so much here and getting pre Abrahamic or pre Piscean, I find gratifying when we start peeling back the layers and looking at how we got here. And there are a lot of different ways in which we got here. And here is an interesting place because we have, like, if we just take English, for example, look at all the different iterations of it just at play right now that include things like ebonics. And whether or not one wants to recognize ebonics, it is its own form of English language out in the English world that a lot of really people. Really hard for me to get uh, behind acts for ask. I know, I know, I know. I'm, I'm, it's, it is still. A language that's being spoken by a lot of people. I also think this is where we're having so much confusion in the world at large right now because a lot of people are not understanding. We're not on the same page. So and this allows for a lot of things to be concealed. Yes. Because yes. Um, there's, you know, what you're describing is the living aspect of of the spoken word. Yes. Which. You know, in and of itself, there's nothing wrong with that. But there's <laughs> there's plenty of evidence that a an informed minority has a huge leverage of power over an uninformed majority. And the funny thing about that is what they're informed about versus the others being uninformed about isn't even super relevant. Like just that kind of knowledge differential is its own type of power. And I don't know what that means about the you know, the collective consciousness question or psyche of the, the world soul or whatever. But back to the, <laughs> you know, you talked about the the shift to the Abrahamics and how <sighs> that's a whole nother can of worms, like how absolutely fake history oh is. God, I know, and I know. The Middle Ages are dark ages and everything that we're told about the history of Rome and ancient Greece is, uh, I've got a whole episode that I'm, I'm, probably recorded tomorrow just covering off the forgeries created in the renaissance that were passed off as the works of the ancient greeks and romans provable forgeries yet are still held up as the uh you know the gold standard of what academic historians will say that they know about the archaic world yeah but the high on truth. that note <laughs> uh the <laughs> the the power differential wielded by the priest class which was no was not separate from the ruling class at any point in history, nor is it now, was always the secret of letters. And I think that that's what a lot of the the logos symbolism is one of the things that it conceals and the various savior deities, that archetype, one of the things that it represents is the secret of letters. But as an example for that, the Latin word for secret is... Lateo. The Latin word for letter is litera. <laughs> it's it's basically the same thing, you know. Um, and in Latin, words that terminate with a, a vowel or with an s are interchangeable. So what I'm saying isn't that crazy. Like there's the word, the Latin word for work is opera or opus. Same meaning, same word. So when I say litera or lateos. I'm basically saying, you know, secret and letter, but it's like the same thing. (laughs) It means hidden or to hide. So that's a, 
<laughs> that's a small, you know, slice of the pie of of why I believe that. But you know, think about just like the fact that the the papal bulls were issued from the Cathedral of Saint John Lateran, which is hold it has the root lateo or hidden or secret right in it, plus the word Anna, which is place. So Saint John place of the secret or pla- the hidden place. <laughs> That's where they were p- issuing their papal bulls from. Mm. I feel really grateful to be here and now with this period of time where we can actually start cracking open some of this, pardon my modern vernacular here, but fuckery that has gone on with the stories we're told and the theoretics that we live in as cornerstones of reality when so much of it, if not all of it, was, well, construed in a way to direct the collective or at least certain people in the collective uh, in one way. Mine, so that would be the folk, I guess, a great 80s man is the royal family and the poor. And so, you know, the priesthood and the upper echelon or the elite, if you will, I'm just trying to keep that separate from the people and those that were literate were able to control the masses and part of controlling them was rewriting stories or creating stories out of nowhere, just like was done with bloodlines where you would have pretenders or interlopers come through and then you were told this person is of that bloodline. Bloodline's an interesting, whole interesting thing to go down. But here we are now and there's slang left and right. There's sub English languages and I'm saying sub I I don't want to be too crazy with that but I don't want to get lost in it being less than um okay and uh so like the abonics thing where everyone is speaking and so few people understand what they're saying and then we have emojis coming on board and oh and I even forgot my biggest point with oh, why I was bringing up Break Secret it in. Of letters is that those word those uh, languages like Latin, which think Latin Lateo, <laughs> it's practically the same word. Uh, they're what we call dead languages, so they don't change over time, and neither does Hebrew. Uh, and the point of that is that we are, you know, we're working with these living languages with constant shifting meanings, and there's still things we can infer out of out of the root word roots of words that that don't really change, but uh, you know the 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 priestarchy is working with a system that doesn't change where they have a, a stronger ability to transmit their intent to one another across time. And that's not even, you know, I'm not even accounting for in this description of gematria yeah. or the powers of notation related to letters and how that encodes information for the, you know, the, the traveling priest class of the ancient world. So that's why, that's what I was trying to get at was, uh, you know, the living languages versus dead languages and what that means for the uh, <laughs> the the profane, uh, the vulgar, if you will, versus yes. the, uh, the elect or the initiated. Well, that I mean, I think that that's at the base of so much of what what really to me is relevant. I mean, when I'm looking at the fact that people are graduating now and they don't know how to read and write and you look at how people text message or communicate it's almost hard to understand you know to, instead of writing out t-o-o or t-o or t-w-o you just have a, a letter two and then u is a u and this degradation or mm, i don't know how to say this in a friendly way uh, it feels like there's an intention by some sort of idea of social engineering that has created this dyslexic reality of communication amongst people. And now that machines are on board, our phones and all this, and now J- chat GPT that, you know, is writing books and stuff, 
This is getting complicated, and it, it is looking more complex and interesting for sure. And, well, I want to add to this because you yeah, know, bring final it thing about time. Yeah, because that can't like. There's more to say there. There's so much is, more. <laughs> one symptom of what you're talking about with the the devolution of language is the gratification, instant gratification, shortcut mentality of a lot of Western people. And we're all, you know, we're all playing that game to some degree. What I would add to this equation is that we've demonstrated various ways that time seems to have a relativity about it, but we haven't even yet brought up that the sense of the passage of time is itself relative. And yes, yes. <laughs> I mean, we all know that, right, from personal experience that sometimes an afternoon feels like it flies by and other times it feels like it drags by. Yeah. And what is, you know, let's figure out, I think we all got to ask ourselves the question, what are the variables that modulate that sense of the passage of time? And one of the variables that definitely speeds up our, our perception of the passage of time or shortens the amount that we can do with our time is the I'm busy, I'm in a hurry mentality. So anytime someone tells me, I would, I would ask you to do this, but you're I know you're busy. I always say, never call me busy again. <laughs> never, ever call me busy again because I used to be busy and I used to be hurrying. And that doesn't mean I don't, you know, sometimes work efficiently or quickly or I'm Aries, my sun sign. So I do, you know, I tend to move fast naturally. But the point being that that mindset is in it of itself something that, that uh, you know, dilates our aperture of time. Uh, in the inverse sense. So that's a plague. The other aspect about this, other than, you know, one, one, another thing that is, I I feel very relevant to how we can, ha- you know, harness the potential of our time more effectively rather than feeling like it's a, a restrictive quantity, instead feeling like it's an expansive opportunity, is to consider the two different kinds of time. Most people probably have never even thought about that there's actually two different kinds of time. Maybe there's more. But we've been talking about chronos, which in Greek, I love Greek because they have different words for the same concept that distinguish various versions of the same concept, whereas we will just have one word. Like there's – people might know there's like several words for love in Greek – that are different types of love, but there's also two different kinds of time that I'm aware of. And Kronos is the measured time, the time on the clock, our group consensus, um, you know, experience of time. I'll meet you at 3 PM, et cetera. And most people are living as slaves to that. (laughs) They're slaves to Kronos. And I mean that on like many levels, Saturn, (laughs) you know, the Saturn death cult, whatever you want to call it. They're running on the hamster wheel. Now, the thing about Kronos is when, why I call it the hamster wheel, and I, that's such a good metaphor, is that it's distinguished by its cyclical repetition, that the measurement of this Kronos time is based on the sun going around the earth or <laughs> uh, – sorry, that might not be everyone's cosmology – but <laughs> the sun going around the earth or the uh, the cycle of the year, you know – et cetera, et cetera. And that's something that it repeats, right? It's on repeat. And most people's experience of life that are, especially the ones that are having this very restrictive, busy uh, feeling where they don't have, they feel like they don't have a lot of time is that they're doing the same thing every, you know, five days a week, they're doing the same thing from eight to five or nine to five. And that's also an, an example of how this repetitious, cyclical, repeating type of chronos measured collective time is affecting people. And so that's the collectivism of it all. Uh, But then there's another word for time in Greek called kyrios, which interestingly is, is a homonym for a Greek word that means Lord, like kyrios Jesus, Lord Jesus. (laughs) So that (laughs) think about that in (laughs) contrast to Saturn, you know, the father, and Jesus, the son, yada, yada. But Kyrios, uh, it means subjective time, apart from meaning Lord as a homonym. 
And subjective time is our, as it sounds, subjective or individual experience of the flow of time. And so we're looking at a version of time that's collectivized and a version of time, a collectivized and, and uh, cyclical and a version that's subjective, individuated and non-cyclical, non-repetitious. So apart from the what's already been stated about the subjective flow of time based on what we're doing, now think about that even d- more deeply. The times were t- where <sighs> there's like two ways that I could think of that it feels like time actually slows down or or expands outward. One would be when it's a drag, like you're, you know, you're in high school and you're in detention. That's one way. But <laughs> another way is when you're really in your, you know, I would, uh, I, I relate this to, especially in times when I, I was really exploring the world more fully and freely for the first time, uh, getting out of my old boxes as an early 20s person and going to like transformational art festivals. And I'd noticed that a weekend <laughs> felt like a week or two weeks as opposed to flying by just sitting at, in my room playing video games over the weekend, which was my previous experience. And what I'm saying here is that your subjective flow of time is modulated towards skewed towards your benefit when you're doing something that is your soul's purpose for being here, learning a lesson or changing or evolving your soul. So for most people that are on the Kronos repetitious hamster wheel, their their curios time is actually frozen because the curios time, subjective time, only progresses when we progress as a soul. And when we progress as a soul, it, sl- it stops Kronos and curios takes over. When we're in the cyclical pattern repetitious collectivism version of time, Kyrios stops and Kronos takes over. And to some degree, there may be like a spectrum that you're on between one and the other that shifts throughout the day or throughout the week or throughout the year. But I want people to really keep that in mind that the the only time that's real is the Kyrios time. Because when you eject from the body and you're done with this particular incarnation, the only thing that will have mattered is how much did your soul grow? Yes. And that's the real measure of how long your life was. And some people's soul grows immensely in a 20-year life. And other people's soul grows barely a, f- a flicker in an 80-year life. So that's the, like, to me, that's the deep knowledge of time. Mm. And that's the way that we should interface with time. Incredible. I just really enjoy you. And I feel like we only scratched the surface. You are a deep well, and I could tell this. I feel quite satisfied after having this chat with you and moving back and forth. And I thank you for playing this back and forth game with me. So if people want to book you and the biofield work you do, how do they go about that? And then also all the other stuff, where do they find you, etc.? So if they go to my website, innerversepodcast.com, and it's I-N-N-E-R-V-E-R-S-E, podcast.com, they'll find links to everything I do through that site. Uh, I'm active on YouTube. There's a video version of all my shows on YouTube, uh, but you can also subscribe to Innerverse on any of the uh, audio RSS feed channels you might be accustomed to, iTunes, Spotify, you know. All of them, essentially. The biofield tuning or oracle card sessions, you can book through just getting in touch with me at my email, chance at interversepodcast.com. Or if you go to the website, there should be a shop tab. Or a sa- actually, I think the sound healing page is its own like uh, like headliner link. But essentially, it's interversepodcast.com slash sound dash healing. And that's a, a good link to follow up on. If you are curious about getting a session or you want to learn more about it. Oh, I see. Okay. The link on the top of the site says get tuned, <laughs> but <laughs> the, the URL is sound dash healing after my domain. And there, there's going to also be links of, uh, of various content that I've created, you know, some conversations with Eileen, uh, episodes where I've 
given an, a large overview of the the process of the biofield. <laughs> so, you know, there's also some testimonials on there that you can read about other people's experience with getting tuned. Yeah, it's all it's all there on that page. And uh, if people are curious about it or they think they want to do it, I recommend, you know, don't wait necessarily not to be a high pressure salesman or anything, but I, uh, I tend to run about four to six weeks out on bookings. So from the time that, you know, you submit your donation to receive a, a booking link to when you actually can get on my calendar, it's it, like, it's at least a month, if not longer. So that's a, you know, Keep hopefully that that's a testament to the fact that people are, <laughs> are enjoying it. I, I've, as I've progressed with it, uh, I find that about half my sessions these days are repeat clients. So that's a, a fun thing about it for me. I like to continue to the journey with people and, and go deeper. But, you know, that means that they must be getting some out of it. I'm leaving this in such a happy place and smiling. And again, I want to thank you for dreaming over here at the Cosmic Salon with me. I had a lot of fun. I uh, appreciate when I get the opportunity to go on someone else's show. It's a different kind of flow state for me. It uh, it sparks things within me that, you know, like I alluded to at the beginning of the whole thing, why I started the podcast was because these sort of deep conversations are how we really get to the 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 well of what we think and what we know. And this was a great example of that. I really enjoyed the, the time question. It's uh, magical that you even asked that because it led to such cool places. And uh, yeah, I had a lot of fun. Thanks for having me on. All right. There we have it. Another show here in the Cosmic Salon. I want to thank the producers of the show. Cass, Claire Cathcart, Denise Bissell, Liz Radikin. Eric Peterson, Heather, Jake Vanek, Jennifer the Bruce, Kate Kukulkan, Carrie, Laura Dunn, Lynn Radius, Marcy Shapiro, Mark Betcher, Melanie Poe, Mia Bell, Neil McNaughton, Noelle Jeanette, Pamela Hodal, Rod Knight, Sarah Etta, Stephen Mercer, Susan Jenkins, Susan Miller, Wise Night Owl, and Babs, our moderator extraordinaire in the green room, as well as my partner here, uh, Miss Meowface Killa on Instagram, Meredith, who runs all of the socials out there and does the booking. Much love to you. Meredith, and thank you, as well as everyone else that comes to the Cosmic Salon and spends your time or money or energies here. I much appreciate it. We are growing in number. There is an undertow, and things are happening. Our lights are shining bright in the darkness of this current time. So thank you. As always, the dreamer loves the dream. The dreamer feeds the dream. The dreamer awakens within the dream. Thank you for dreaming here with me in the Cosmic Salon.